Arthur Clark, one of my very favorite people, who has been with us at CBS for several of these missions now. And Arthur, wh what do you think we ought to do next? I mean, what would you like to see? The space station or Mars or well, perhaps both? Uh, well, I guess you'd like to see both. We all like to see uh, all we can do, but uh, given some national priority problems. We will see both. I think the first order priority is the establishment of an economical space transporter so that we can establish a large space station which will act as an astronomical observatory which will tell us a very great deal about Mars and the other planets before we get there because then with large telescopes in space near the Earth we'll learn a great deal about these places and also from the space station in the space station we can develop the techniques of long-range space exploration. Arthur, uh, you've been dreaming of this moment long before many of us did, beginning back in the mid-1930s, you were yeah. writing about going out to the moon. What was your feeling when we saw this thing happen today? Well, I don't think I did feel anything. I think we all sort of, the time just stopped to me, and I think it stopped for everybody. It was just a, a hole in history, you know, and every, the whole world, everything, my heart stopped, breathing stopped. Mine certainly did, and I think all of ours did. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I can't imagine a, I can't imagine a moment to, to, to equal this. Uh, the only thing I could imagine is if some fellow came forward and could say positively, we're not going to have any more war. I think this is a step in that direction because this sort of thing is making our stupidities here on Earth seem more and more intolerable, and I think this may be the greatest result of the space program. Speaking of national rivalries, do you have any thoughts about what the Russians may be doing now that we know that their unmanned uh, Luna 15 is in an orbit very similar to ours around the equator of the moon? <coughs> My theory is that it's going to land with a bottle of vodka. <laughs> a congratulatory <laughs> bottle of vodka? I or a so. ceremonial Present. bottle? Well, thank you, Arthur Clark. Bill Stout's at North American uh, Aviation out in Downey, California, North American Rockwell's called now with Robert Heinlein, another eminent science fiction writer. And we want to keep you here, Arthur, because you two fellows may have something to chat uh, about. Uh, and let's bring them in. Bill Stout and Robert Heinlein. You know, Walter, in thinking back to what these men have written about and done so many years before the landing of Apollo 11, I think it's worth recalling that uh, Mr. Heinlein's book, Rocket Ship Galileo, was written in the 40s. And the film, Destination Moon, 1950, that's right. That's a long time ago to talk about a landing and a return. It's been thought about for, well, the first novel written about the, uh, a trip to the moon was not written by me. It was written by Cyrano de Bergerac a long, long time ago. Nonetheless, they, you, were, you were far ahead. And you were talking in your book about uh, nuclear power as the means of getting yes, there. Yes, nuclear power. We will be using nuclear power in spaceships. This is a certainty. They were going to go on bigger, farther. Uh, I agree with what Arthur said a while ago about the possible effect on war on this planet. But I, I think this whole business today, this week, has been thought of in many cases in too small terms. This is the greatest event in all the history of the human race up to this time. This is. Today is New Year's Day of the year one. If we don't change the calendar, historians will do so. The human race, this is our change, our puberty rights, bar mitzvah, confirmation from the change from infancy into adulthood for the uh, human race. And we are going to go on out, not only to the moon, to the stars, we're going to spread. I don't know that the United States is going to do it. I hope so. I have, I'm an American myself. I want it to be done by us. But in any case, the human race is going to do it. It's utterly inevitable. We are going to spread through the entire universe. It's a grand painting, Mr. Heinlein, with very broad strokes indeed. Do you think that perhaps the hostilities that still exist on Earth, I, I think of the, the Chinese rather than the Soviets at this point, since we seem to be in friendly terms, circling the moon. Do you think these hostilities could head us off before we begin to realize what you think we should? I think that this is the most hopeful thing that has happened to us in that 
We are now going out as far as the moon. I don't know whether we're going to get rid of war and hostility. I'm not at all sure of that. But I do know that your grandchildren, the descendants of all of us, will be in colonies elsewhere. The human race will not die. Even if we spoil this planet, the human race will not die. It's going to go on and on and on. And this is Confucius, I think it was, said, a journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. Today we have made the one step. We're about to make that one step from uh, at uh, Tranquility Base in a matter of minutes now. Yes, certainly what we've all been waiting for. Walter, do you think that uh, Mr. Heinlein is perhaps a, a bit too bold in his predictions? I wouldn't think so, and I'm sure Arthur Clarke sitting here alongside me doesn't think so. Uh, we've got uh, earthbound constraints to expiration, but it's as inevitable now as, uh, as the tides themselves that are controlled by that moon on which men landed today. Uh, you can't stop progress, and this is progress. This is where men go. We know we can't. If we could, we'd uh, probably stop some of the highways built through the middle of our forests and our cities. Uh, we'd stop a lot of other things, but uh, it can't be done. And uh, uh, this promises benefits uh, uh, which you can't even imagine today. I, I doubt, Arthur, that you and, uh, and Robert Heinlein out there in California, the two of you, could possibly sit together and with all of your great imaginative uh, capabilities, put together a list of all of the benefits to be derived by mankind, or even a small portion of them, uh, from this uh, great feat today. This is true. And uh, we often use this parallel of coming out of the sea onto land. And I'd like to take, take it further. You know, in the sea, we could not develop civilization for a simple reason. In the ocean, you cannot have fire. And fire is a key to all our civilization, all our technology. I believe in the same way when we get beyond the atmosphere, out into the new environment of space, we will find new powers, new capabilities, as much beyond fire as that was beyond anything that could be done in the sea. We're going to have to find something as a substitute for fire, aren't we? You can't uh, have a fire out there any more than you can have it in the sea. Well, you can have, you can, you can have fire, you can have, your, you can have chemical reactions, of course. After all, that's what our rocket, how our rockets work, but we'll have other things. I think in space we may discover a way of controlling gravity. I don't think we've had any chance of learning much about gravity here on the Earth because we're in it all the time, you see. But when we get out in space, effectively beyond the pull of gravity, we'll be able to study it and perhaps learn how to control it. And that will be a tremendous breakthrough. Do you two fellows know each other, Arthur Clark oh, yes. and Robert Heinlein? I stayed with Bob uh, back in 1952 in his, when he was living in Colorado Springs. I was wondering if I was going to have to introduce you by oh, no. uh, long-distance television here. Uh, you don't seem to say hello to each other. Either. No, we, uh, Arthur and I have known each other for 20 years yes. now, I think. Uh, I visited his, his home in Ceylon. He's vis visited the home that I had at that time in Colorado. And I, I think, I don't think we are in any disagreement on any point about any of this. No. The, the, I find that the only, only thing that troubles me about this is that people talk about other things and don't realize how big a day this is. This is the biggest day the human race has ever seen. This is the most important day in history. This is the most important thing since the human race learned to talk. Mr. Heinlein, I think it's very possible as, uh, that Derek Severide, as he is wont to do, and almost every time he opens his mouth, put his finger right on it again. Uh, we just can't concentrate on a little tiny spot very long without our minds wandering off. And uh, as great as this day is, uh, the, the peripheral things kind of impinge. Uh, maybe it's our escape valve uh, in some way. I just wonder when you two get together at Arthur's home in Ceylon or your home, Mr. Heinlein, uh, uh, you must talk over ideas and things, but do you have to kind of hold back from some of those most imaginative ideas for fear the other guy will go off and write about it? <laughs> I think we both have enough ideas to keep us equally busy for the rest of our lives. I think that's highly probable. <laughs> highly probable. Thank you very much, Bill Stout, and uh, Mr. Heinlein, Albert Heinlein, another eminent science fiction Thank writer you, in California. And uh, Arthur Clark, you in New York, and we'll be coming back to you, of course, from time to time as this great day continues to unfold. And now we know that the hatch is due to be open uh, in 59 minutes from now.